Yep. So uh, the aim of this interview is to have sort of uh, another side of, of our ecosystem. So our ecosystem, you know, we uh, work in, in academia as a staff, as permanent staff, maybe uh, us, our teacher teaching or some of us are doing uh, like uh, bringing money in term in term of projects. Yeah, please, uh, Shannon. Uh, or uh, some some of us as well try to help like uh, administration things, but we have the second leg in in academia, which is a student. So, uh, Cole is a student at uh, chemistry department. He tried to, who has some teaching activities, so he tried to do some sort of um, establish uh, some program, some teaching program. He reflect on some points. Um, after after uh, this discussion that we will go now, uh, I think I will present to you a presentation from a businessman uh, from uh, Austria. Uh, and maybe tomorrow we'll have two other presentations uh, and to discuss this. Uh, but I don't know, actually, during this short presentation with Cool, uh, he highlights some, some opportunities, some challenges. Um, uh, he said that there is a need for for such courses, and not only for the uh, for the uh, not only for the science part or hard science part or chemistry or geology, but also in the other side like social science and uh, and law. There is a need to get some knowledge there. So, what do you think about that? If, would you like to reflect on that? just to open the discussion somehow. Yeah, please, Sabina. Yeah, probably I should start because I'm in, kind of involved in this as well. Yep. So Actually, I, can, uh, start, I, yeah. I can just comment on that. Uh, during the discussion, you heard that the, the head of the geology department uh, show a call uh, or sent to the call uh, a name of a professor. Who yeah, that was lead. me. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. actually, this is Sabina. Yeah. So yeah, the thing is, uh, yeah. So first, I can say where we where, where we had the ch where we have still challenge. This is a, a schedule of students. So the idea was to mix students of geology with students of uh, chemistry uh, at bachelor level, which means three generation of uh, chemistry, three generations of uh, of uh, geology students. And then it's impossible to find time where they all can be free because one of requirement was that this is something that it's happening during, let's say, office hours. So, I mean, we cannot really find time when everyone is uh, available uh, from Monday to, to Friday, from eight to, I don't know, three or four in the afternoon because they have other, other obligations. So basically we stuck with that and we still haven't got the time. Uh, so hopefully in next semester, we will have some other opportunities or what I suggested, in fact, that we try with something like evening event. So at least if we have evening event, everyone will have opportunity to join and that it will be really decision of students, will they do that or not? Because now if we create an event, then students have to decide, will they go to their regular courses or they will just yeah, go for someone stock. Uh, yeah, other things are fine, and uh, yeah, there are plenty of, of, of interesting topics that can be covered. They can be also relevant for students of, of, uh, of biology, of technology, I mean, for students from social science and, and, and so on. So it's not really difficult to find the speakers. It's not difficult to find, um, yeah, a good topic. It's a problem to find time. Huh. Um, yeah, in fact, that was what I was planning to to say yeah but uh, uh sabina uh, do you think that you will give the student some credit out of this no so i mean if it's event like uh, you know just uh, visiting someone's seminar talk or something like that uh, it's not we cannot provide credits but this again something i mean it would be really good if for instance in this workshop we have someone who is sitting in the student, like a UIT student administration, because this is place where we might find some obstacles. So for instance, at UIT, we cannot give, uh, we can give either five or 10 credits 
there is nothing that we can give like two or three credits. At least this is what we are say, what, what I have been told when I came to Tromsø. And then of course you cannot give someone five credits just because the person was sitting on, on some talks. Uh, also what Cole mentioned, this is more kind to attract attention that there is a need for multidisciplinary approach rather than to, to give credits. Then again, maybe student, students will not be kind of motivated to, let's say, waste their time if credits are not provided. Mm. This is probably where we should involve Melina's uh, expertise in kind of philosophy of teaching. So how to make topics attractive for students though they don't see benefits immediately. I mean, mm. benefits will come, but not immediately in, in, in kind in, in the way of credits. So, yeah. Yeah, at this moment we were not planning to, to give any any credits. Actually, I, before I I go to Melina to comment on your uh, idea or uh, your suggestion, uh, here uh, our Cloud Earth project running a, a separate program or parallel program for students for master students, and we succeeded to uh, give the students who are enrolled in this program from the Faculty of uh, Fishery uh, five credits from one of the special uh, courses. But other students who are coming from uh, Faculty of Science, for example, or uh, Faculty of Health, they can't get it even within the same university. So we couldn't give the students who are coming from Faculty of Science and att attending the course any credit because they are not enrolled in Faculty of Fishing. So I think this is, I think, problem we need we need, as you said, uh, Sabina would like to bring it up a bit to the administration to find a way. We need to create such nice courses, but they just stop us because there is rules saying, no, you can't give credit for students and the students will not attend courses without credit. But maybe I can bring it to Melina. If you have some ideas in order to make the courses attract students, so they would like to come to attend the course because of the course, not because of the credit. Do you think you have some thoughts? Because I think this is this is uh, all of us here are struggling with this point. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I have uh, written about that a physical uh, paper. I can send it to you, uh, but the, the, the paper is not pointing to solution. It's actually criticizing this uh, uh, technocratic framework for teaching where uh, you need to get something back every time you do something like uh, in this in this paper that I can share with you I'm actually calling back for a like Socratic education uh, where the students were there for for learning and that was the the payment that they they got from uh, teaching learning and not point but when once you start to break down up the, the Bologna uh, process, that you start to break down things on points and grades, that that's only that that matters. <laughs> so it, I I um, unfortunately I don't have a solution to how to motivate mm -hmm. the students that are not motivated internally motivated already to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but I can I can think about that is is. It's a very difficult question. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you can, Melina, share with us this uh, this paper, it would be great. We can put it in, if you allow us, It's if it's open access or not, I don't know. But if it's open access, you can allow us just to put it together with our uh, part of the course or this workshop in order just to be available for others. So they can just, because as you highlight, this is not only personal problem with us it's you seem to be that major problem you even highlighted in a paper so it would be great to share this with us so i don't know maybe i have a question for christina um because uh, from during during the break time christina you already uh, highlighted that you are working with a different erasmus plus project and so on uh, do you think there is a way at the eu level to fix this problem, this uh, credit across universities. So, so here, here we have a problem within the university. So students who are enrolled in a course 
in one institute, they can get credit because they are already set in another institute. So do you think this is a problem also EU? We can cover it somehow, we can fix it somehow. This was the whole point of the Erasmus program that started in the, in the 90s and the Bologna process so that you could transfer credits from one university to another. Um, unfortunately, um, there is still some issues depending on countries that might still have their degrees highly defined. Huh. Like, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I did my Erasmus in the late 90s, uh, I was jealous, I went to Belgium and I was super jealous of the students there at the, the University of Liège where I went, that they could go for a semester biology students, they went and did one semester in the Canaries, came back and the whole semester was accredited. The University of Alicante in Spain, the, the systems are super defined. You have your degree program that you have defined, you have listed the number of credits and it has been recognized by the ANECA, by the National Accreditation Board. And so to get your degree, you have to have done exactly those courses and those credits in those fields. And so you can't just go for like a semester. The, it is your university who has to look at the courses you did while you were abroad and see if they are the equivalent of one of the ones that you did. And so there has been some flexibilization increased in that, like you've got student, maybe some universities, some programs have a certain number of what they call free credits. You know, you've got your obligatory classes, your optional classes, you can choose six out of this list of 12, and then maybe you can do 12 free credits, which means you can take a class in just about anything in the university. And that's where some students get credit for sports, choir, for other activities and for exchanges. But it depends, it depends on the systems. And there is, in Europe, there's a very high level of bureaucracy. And the EU has been working towards that. That is the whole point of the Bologna process. Mm. But um, you're working with 27 different countries and 27 different educational systems with their own bureaucracy and level and everything. It is you have to design it carefully and you have to look into it. Um, uh, it, it. It all comes down to, in terms of like a project, a proper design at the beginning and, and, select, and already choosing to work in, in courses or aspects that you know or that you think do have an equivalent so that they could get recognition from one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Because just at the level of one project, one group of professors, you're not going to change your university or your national mm. accreditation system. Yeah. It, I mean, it has to, it has to be worked. It's, it's, that's a systemic change that goes at the political level and at the level of rectors or everything. So um, it just, the only way you can get, you can't change it. You can get around it in you know, a little maneuvering thing. Um, if you design carefully your your proposal, your project, your your idea of your courses, if it's if it's closely, then then yeah, because there are systems in place for recognition. We've been working for that towards that for thirty years. Yeah, but you have to you have to see what the conditions are, where you're going to work, and then work within that framework. Yeah, but uh, maybe before we go to Melina, I just comment on that because Sabina uh, told us there is a problem here when you are going around the things. Because for example, we try here in this Cloud Earth I to go around and give the student credit through this uh, special program. But this special program, it's appear at the end in the certificate as a special program. Mm -hmm. They didn't define it like uh, they got uh, skills in business administration, for example, because this is our target in this program. So, well, that 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 depends on your university and that I mean that in one sense that's the consequence of too much IT of too ah. much computers yep because everything has to be codified you have to have it and and it, within a standard level of a, the administration of a university they can't have they, they they need a box to tick that you did this and and they can't imagine every possible thing that a student could get that would give them credit so it's not going to be in the list and it's going to be a special program. I mean, if before we had worked with all these boxes and ticks and everything, then it could be added in because it was a manual. It wasn't as automated as it is now. Mm -hmm. So the only thing you can do towards that is um, if you're targeting a program or a course that you really want, I mean, you need to work with the support of the, the rectoral team and, and say that you, that what you're designing is something that you believe should be done 
by all students, whether it can or not, you know, it has a very wide target in terms of your, your number of students that it could that it show that it could have high value in terms of um, these students entering the labor market afterwards and then negotiate for the university to include that as a box that can be ticked in their automatic system mm -hmm. so that it can appear in, in the transcripts. Mm -hmm. But um, otherwise, the only other thing you can do is that, um, you know, you, you make sure you've got some very professional and crafted certificates that students have done this and then they just need to include it within their curriculum afterwards. You know, they the same as they send their transcript, their curriculum, everything, if they've got, I mean, or you can talk with the university because if you're looking at one course, so you want to help, you know, you want to help address this problem for the future as well, not just for your one aspect, to work with the university about creating a, like a certificate for students on their, um, supplemental training or studies or formation, something that the university can certify for other institutions and for employers and everything so that, um, and that would have to be a bit more open that they can certify that this student did this course or this program or whatever. And by doing it, they developed the following um, competences. Yes, yeah. uh, and so they would have to develop a system that would apply um, at that and that, but it would have to be more adaptable than tick because and the idea would be that as other things are proposed and progressed that you could integrate it and develop it. Actually, I have one comment on this point, but I would like to hear Melina first and then I can uh, tell you my comment. Please, Melina. Sorry, just, I can jump in with one example of the university that tried to do this in Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. uh, so their center of employment um, I don't know if they finished it or not, because this was several years ago. They were developing um, an online job platform to help their students, but not just job searching, but it was going to be to post student CVs. And they, it was going to be certified by the university. So they were going to work with the students and also be able to certify. It was going to be a fact that the university was going to recognize all these other abilities that they would have developed through complementary courses. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to have a place they're developing this database where employers could go and look at a student's profile and see, you know, the university certifies that they have done this, 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 and this. Yep. So people have been thinking about how to do this in a way. Yeah. Sorry. Another second comment now for, for my side, but uh, first Melina, and then I come, come to you. Yeah, I'll try to be very short. I think that we have two, two problems here. One that is this uh, mobility across universities and another one that is mobility across uh, departments or faculties within the university. And uh, mobility across universities, we have uh, 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 several like frameworks such as the Erasmus uh, to, to work with. Uh, and then here the question is not on the possibility, but the question on uh, whether it is uh, worth to put a lot of effort in setting up a, a, like a Erasmus corporation if the students in Norway do not use it or use it in a very, very uh, uh, small degree. What happened is that the, 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 the students in Norway, they are not as mobile as uh, international students. And there are many uh, explanations for that. One of them is that uh, an international student uh, has a very <laughs> like temporary, um, life while they are students they don't they don't they have a backpack and they spend the whole day at the at the library uh and and study while the the culture in our is a bit different the, our, our students at the university at the bachelor degree already they have already a family uh, some have uh, kids uh they have a loan for the house they own a, a car uh, they they have a, a job. They work part time. Most of them, so they are not only studying. They are they're more adults. They are more adults, so they don't have the the, the possibility to uh, extend uh, some time abroad and then come um, back. Mm. So so but then their mobility across universities is possible. Uh, there is a framework for that, but maybe the framework doesn't fit to the Norwegian uh, type uh, of students, like the, mm. the Department of History has spent a lot of time creating this Erasmus uh, corporation with the consortium with amazing universities in. We have done the same here in, in philosophy. 
and then uh, we just don't don't manage to reach to reach to go abroad. Mm. Uh, and and that's that's very sad. A lot of work that that that, that turns out to nothing. Uh, when it comes to mobility across departments or across faculties, uh, I, I, uh, and the, the incentives that we can give for the students to recruit, I, I here I also think that there is not a problem to to forge this uh, uh, like uh, special program, supplemental training with certificates, validate somehow these certificates. But the, the problem is that the the, the financial aspect aspect of it that doesn't um, touch the students is between is within the university. Uh, the uh, the university or the department they get uh, money for students that accomplished a program. There are some small amount of money that they get for accomplishing a course. But mm. if the course is multidisciplinary, is only the department that owns the course that gets the money. The money. Mm. And then how can you build a, a multidisciplinary course if we, uh, you will have to make some of the departments to work for free and then they will not agree. And then uh, so it creates a situation where, where you have uh, no incentives uh, and to, 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 to make this cooperation work because everyone wants to own the course, but only one can own the course and get the financial uh, support, but then uh, to make the course feasible. But then that means that the other departments will have to work for free. Mm. And then they, are, they do not accept. So it is a, is a trap, it is a financial trap mm. here at the administration level. So uh, whether mobility across the university is possible, mobility across departments, well, within this current uh, uh, administrative framework that gives financial support only for students that accomplish a whole course or a whole program, it, it's not totally un unfeasible. Mm. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, I have also two comments here, but maybe Sabina first. Yes. So, yeah, I think that what Melina said, uh, said about this, uh, yeah, the, the, the lifestyle of students in Norway, it's significantly different than probably some other countries. But I think that it's even something deeper in the motivation of students. I have two, three examples when we invited the world leading experts in the field, doesn't matter. So, for instance, one was really the leading expert in hydrothermal deposits. And uh, that person was giving uh, intensive course of one week in Tromsø. Uh, and we opened the course for other students, uh, mainly from uh, Scandinavia, but also, yeah, we had, uh, we said, yeah, that we can give some, maybe up to five places for students from Europe in general. So students from Sweden and Finland were competing because we didn't have endless, so we had like 40 places on that course. So students from Sweden and Finland were competing and they were paying from their own pocket. They were fundraising money to cover their travel expenses. And they were like, you know, renting cars in Finland, driving all overnight to be on Monday morning in Tromsø to start with the course. We had students from all over Europe, uh, even students from Turkey. We, and that guy paid from, again, from his own pocket just to have opportunity to listen to this, these talks and be involved in the workshop. And then we couldn't get any students from Tromsø. So it was quite sad. <laughs> I mean, I, literally, I mean, you, you have to force students or really kind of literally, yeah, almost force them to attend. So in, in most of these cases, basically we didn't have uh, Tromsø students. And then students from other Norwegian universities, it was literally zero. So though we have other geological departments. So I don't know, I mean, it, it must be something different. I don't know, is that something that it's already built in during the secondary education? But it's really different to see how students at other universities are competing to enter the course and students that get that literally for free because anyway, they live here, they are around, they don't have intention to, to attend the course. Mm. This is a strange. This is a... It is, yeah. yeah it's it's really also strange. a discussion to have with students. So like organized roundtable, but for both aspects, what would it take for you to, 
to do an Erasmus, to go abroad, to work in other, why, why are students not, um, and to, to look, to take a, a deeper look at the situation and do a, a, an in-depth study about it, because you're not going to solve um, something like that with just, like you said, Melina, if, if no one wants to go on an exchange program, you're not going to solve it on your own. You might have to redesign the program. You might have to get extra support. Uh, there has to be a deeper understanding. I mean, it's a shame because, yeah, not just all the effort that you put into developing these programs, but the the huge value that these programs bring. Okay. I mean, one of the one of the the best things the EU has done, honestly, in the past thirty years, is the Erasmus program. Yep, mobility, the exchange, and and so for people not to be taking advantage, you have it. It would require a study to look at why. And not just for the logistics, because it's not, I mean, what can you do? Is there a way to do shorter courses? Can you be gone for a month? Um, can you do it in summer? But it is, yeah, but you need, it needs an in-depth study of the situation of the students and the people. So it requires working with the students. Hmm. Yeah, Sabina, and then- I, I, I think that Melina was before me. Yeah, so you don't uh, have a comment. I mean, in fact, I, I would like to ask Christina something about Erasmus because I'm I'm a kind of active Erasmus staff. So okay. I'm always, every year I'm applying to teach somewhere else. Uh, and this is great for me as teacher, it's great because then I have also kind of a bigger pool of students, usually from those universities where I'm teaching, I'm trying to recruit students to come then from other countries to Norway to do internship because then they can work even in, yeah, Christina mentioned some universities are not really flexible. And for instance, for my students from Croatia, from where originally I am, I cannot uh, get them here for a semester because for instance, in a relevant uh, field of my research, they have to have crystallography and we don't offer crystallography in Tromso. But I still have opportunity to have them here on a three month internship program for research. In fact, for them, it's even better because then they are really working on their master projects or any kind of projects. Uh, but uh, also in terms of uh, mobility of staff, I think honestly that, that I'm only person from my department who is using uh, staff mobility. So this is also something that maybe we should, and, and I'm always talking with my colleagues about how Erasmus is it's cool and courage. yeah, but uh, yeah, I know it, it, it I works know. at both levels. It, there's the, but the staff mobility address, it'll have the same issue as what Melina was saying for the students want to meet because you've got family. Obviously. Yeah, I do as well. But. It's, harder, <laughs> it's harder to fit in with the work thing, but it is, I think in a lot of cases, so the term is different because in a lot of cases for staff mobility, people don't know about it. Mm. Then you also have language barrier. And I think staff mobility isn't always super well organized because you're looking at going for a week or a month and, and the places that are receiving you sometimes it's just babysitting. So look at what we're doing for a week. It can be boring. I've seen some, cause I've been looking, I haven't done it yet, but I've been looking into it. Um, my problem with staff mobility is I have to apply for it in September and for the whole year. And I'm like, I don't know what events I'm gonna have in May next year. I don't know if I can go somewhere. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but the, the main, another issue is language. Uh, people aren't, are people who aren't comfortable with traveling. The older they are, the more conservative they are, the more worried they are. And it's, it's a cultural shift that's needed. And for students, when there's no uh, recognition, I think there also needs to be a cultural shift or a change in a student's mentality and to tell them, it doesn't matter if you finish your degree in three years or four years or five years. Take a semester off. The courses aren't recognized in your university. So what? That's even better because you're going to learn something that you could not learn in your university, something extra. Fine. You're going to have to repeat the semester be to get your degree. I mean, unless we're talking of the United States where education is prohibitively expensive and the last thing you can afford to do is an extra semester. But in Europe, where most of the university education is free or very reasonably priced, um, it's it's but it's it requires a mind shift and a, and a change in the way of thinking, and that and that can require um, that can be done talking in small groups with students to see what's what they need, how to change them, to organize talks with people who have done exchanges and talking about how it what it brings to them extra and people who, not just students who have done it, but people who have graduated and say how it helped them afterwards in their professional life. And same thing with staff. 
organizing info days or exchanges with staff who have gone, what it can bring it. And, but a lot of time it, it does require work and it's going to require more work from the staff involved in organizing it, but it, it, it can be done. You just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's changing the way people think, and that's never going to be easy. Yep. But the first question is finding out in all senses, why are you not taking advantage of this opportunity for the staff, for the students? Why not? Okay, these are your reasons. Let's see how we can, you know, counter each point. Yeah. I mean, I can say uh, what motivates students in Southern Europe uh, to, to go for Erasmus, because they then see really opportunity that maybe, I mean, I'm talking about Southeastern Europe. So Croatia, I work a lot with Macedonians in Albania and this kind of poor part of Europe. So all opportunities that are coming to those students, they really see them as opportunity because they see that maybe they can benefit of getting good job for international company or for going abroad to, to develop their future, a, a further career. And most of those students who are taking Erasmus exchange, they're really getting after that PhD somewhere else. Uh, maybe for Norwegian students, they don't, they don't need it because there is enough kind of social security in, in the country and you don't have to go somewhere else because you have the best social system in the world. You, you have everything that you need in your own country. So why to, to board yourself to go Tourist somewhere else? Travel. You escape from the winter. I can't imagine that our <laughs> Norwegian students who are begging to go to Spain for the winter semester or Spain or Italy or Greece. <laughs> We have enough Norwegians here on our beaches over the whole winter. I'm surprised there aren't students pounding on the doors saying, send me to Spain. <laughs> yeah, Melina? Well, since we are talking about um, Erasmus, I, I have to say that as, as a student, I have been everywhere with Erasmus. I have been in uh, Germany, Belgium. Uh, Melina, could you please uh, just uh, be close to the microphone? Oh, sorry. Better now? Yeah, better. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I, I start again. Uh, I, I just uh, said that uh, as a student, I have been um, everywhere with Erasmus. Uh, but uh, uh, as a faculty member, I haven't been using the teaching uh, uh, mobility of Erasmus. And one of the reasons is, yes, family. But there, was, but there, there are other reasons as well that uh, it's relating related to the ranking that teaching has uh, in, the, in, in academia. Like the most important uh, or the most, uh, the most like prestigious thing to do in academia is to do research, which means to publish and publish well. And then uh, every time that you engage yourself with um, like some extra teaching that you will need more time to prepare because it's in another language, you also need to adjust for some, um, ad, uh, account for some time that you need for adjusting to, to the new people, networking with them. So uh, it, uh, sometimes it feels like that you are actually losing time uh, in engaging in these extra nice activities mm -hmm. instead of like sitting as much as you can in front of the computer and publishing because that's, that's what actually uh, tells and makes you a great researcher or not. So the, the, there is also part of this uh, a cultural shift, but that can uh, start with some um, other type of uh, regulations uh, that that would actually uh, uh, like give more prestige credit. to other or credit to other types of um, uh, academic activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the the other comment that I had was like what. Of, to Sabina that she asked what, what is going on here that uh, the students uh, don't take these opportunities what, what, what that that you said that there must be a deeper reason and I have been searching for this deeper reason and thought about that and I, I went back to some history to try to understand what is going on here because I, uh, I come from Brazil and I, can, I cannot understand that someone misses a free opportunity to learn uh, and, and I think that this comes back to, to the time that uh, Norway was uh, under the Danish, uh, uh, was, a, was a Danish colony and then Swedish colony where, where um, there was a Danish elite that was supposed to be um, like 
uh, teaching. So they, there was a the, the university was dominated by Danish uh, and Danish theory and Danish uh, culture. And and when the when Norway uh, got free from the, this domination, the society became very flat. Mm. And then uh, like university or high culture, this this became like associated with something negative with an elite and today the society is very flat you can see that a carpenter earns more than a, a phd student uh, a, a practitioner earns more than an associate professor so uh, it's or more or less is uh, everyone earns um, more or less the same and and this creates a, a this incentive to this to the students to work hard and study because as you said they will find a job elsewhere that is equally uh, nice even much better there is no different ranking between being a carpenter and being an associate professor you are all uh, socially um, equal so why you are going to be working overtime and um, like giving so much of your private life and private time for something that you can achieve much easier like you have a job you have a loan you have so i think that that this cultural issue has a historical root and it's difficult to to change now without uh, um, producing introducing inequalities in norway because it's very good that there is social uh, equality in norway and then if you want we, we want to create incentives to the creation of a hierarchy saying that is, that's better for you to study than to work then we are disrupting social equality so mm. I, I don't know how to solve this issue mm. Mm. but that's what i wanted to to can, say can I this is very interesting open. yeah oh, sorry sorry zena no I, I was just i was just going to say but there is also a lot of students that go into university, but I have no idea what they want to do. And yeah. get lost there. And I think a lot of students are a bit like, I rather, or students or start studying, drop out, and I rather work, earn money and start building something instead of seeing all their friends kind of going from, you know, economy to biology or things, because they have no idea what to do. Mm. It's, yeah. it's also a bit of both, yeah. I, I just want to say for the first point you mentioned about, yes, publish or perish and research and, and that as, as for limitation on, on doing these Erasmus staff exchange is that uh, it's, it also depends on how you focus the exchange and how you're moving because uh, going to another university is not just going for teaching, it's for research also. So it can be the means of establishing a new collaboration or developing a collaboration with it. And it's, and it's not just within Europe, this, the staff exchange is also uh, global. So it can be uh, to help establish roots. And, and yes, you're gonna go to another university, you're gonna do some teaching, but you're also gonna be working with the people there. And you can develop research projects together. You can get ideas going because we all know that um, there's no substitute for face-to-face. One week with a, t a group of people that you want to establish a collaboration with and, ex and throwing ideas, exchanging ideas and working in a house so you can get several ideas for papers out in one week that would take you months of email exchanges or video yes. calls. Yes. So uh, it, should, it, it depends again on how you focus things and how you present that opportunity to the staff. It, it's all a way of shifting, shifting the viewpoint. Yeah, and this is exactly why I'm using Erasmus so much because uh, there are projects that are very difficult to, or sometimes you, you have research that will require more time. So for instance, if I'm going in the field in Macedonia, you know, to write the proposal, to apply somewhere, then you have several rejections because, before you get funded. So for me, it's very practical, in fact, to use Erasmus Exchange. And when I'm teaching, they also do field work, which will be like additional week. Or, or things like that. So I'm always combining, of course, teaching with research, field work, yeah, and things like that. So yeah, I definitely found the Erasmus as very, very uh, efficient way for yeah to extend network or keep network working. And in your case, Melina, if you're from Brazil, 
<laughs> even better to find a university to collaborate with in Brazil and have Erasmus send you for a week of teaching and research and then go visit family. <laughs> it also allows opportunities for that. I mean, it, it's a help. It, it, it looks good. I mean, also, I don't know about in Norway, but in Spain, uh, teachers also help with, you know, gaining in prominence and increasing your position. It also depends on research done abroad and research stays abroad and collaborations abroad. So it also helps at that level. And even if the, the what is paid through Erasmus might be a short period or whatever, the fact that you already have part of it paid for, and especially the travel, which is the most expensive, and then you on your own funds or through other funds, you stay on an extra week or to continue working on that collaboration. It is sometimes it's you just need a little bit of help. And that little bit, that's that's what I mean. That the whole point of Erasmus, in a sense, is to encourage people to move to do the exchanges and to give enough financial support to help make that not be too big a burden. They never cover it entirely because they consider that even if you were at your own home, your own place, you're going to have certain costs. So they're like, well, you were going to be spending money in this period anyway. We're just going to help you financially so that you're not spending more money than you usually would. Hmm. They have the same philosophy with projects as well. They never finance projects to a real 100%, even though some of them do pay 100% of the budget, others don't. It depends on the percentage. But the budget that's included is never the real thing because they want people to be, you know, if you're really invested in this, if this is really important to you, you're also going to put your money where your mouth is. Shabby? I think uh, Melina was first. I think Melina is raising uh, the hand from previous one, right? Oh, uh, yeah, but I have some follow-up, but I think you should say something now, Francisco, <laughs> and I come after because <laughs> I have already. Okay. I just have a quick comment uh, about the uh, Erasmus making covering the difference uh, of uh, living costs. I came to Norway as an Erasmus student in 2009, and uh, I got a fantastic help from uh, the Erasmus program of uh, 135 euros a month, which I can assure you it will not cover the difference in costs between living in northern Spain, which is not the same as southern Spain, it's already the expensive part of Spain, but still. When you compare to Norway, it does not really cover the the costs. So, they I, I just wanted to make the point that they they say they cover the differences. They they help, but still, it's a huge economic loss that you take. So, and I know several people uh, in my generation, of course, that's uh, some years ago already, that decided not to even try for Erasmus because they they were kind of not uh, not maybe struggling, but not in the situation to actually take the risk. Of moving to a different country and then finding themselves in uh, in dire straits. Mm. So that that could be one of the limitations we're still finding. Mm. Sabina that's or Melina? No, it was Melina. I will say Melina. something okay. later. Okay. No, quickly, I'm just going to quickly jump in. Sorry, that's more of a south to north problem. It definitely shouldn't be the problem so much with the Norwegian students going south because of the the budget difference. But it is a huge problem. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that was my comment. And especially, again, I see from kind of poor countries, so my students coming from Southern Europe, they are working all summer, you know, completely non-relevant jobs. I don't know, working in kitchens, washing dishes, no matter what, cleaning hotels, to make money, to make this additional amount. And then they see still Erasmus is very beneficial because they will get better education. They will have at the end this paper that will show that they were mobile, that they took action. So, I mean, they see all benefits and yeah, their parents are supporting them. You know, there are different ways how they are coming, but they, they, they are finding way to, uh, to come. Just one comment on that Please now me. is that the UIT has a budget to top the, the, the scholarships uh, from Erasmus and from uh, Marie Curie. Uh, when they are uh, too low, when they do not achieve the, some of the minimum necessary for living in Norway. So the university has a pot for that, that you can okay, apply for supplementing the, the, the resources. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I would like to, to uh, that I was going to say was that, well, I, I taught in an Erasmus course in France this year, and I went there for one day and then back. Um, uh, and uh, of there are, it's not only the 
publish or perish uh, problem here, but it's also that um, when we when the staff is abroad, they still have uh, uh, duties at the department, such as supervision. These never go away. So you can't be away long yeah. without uh, uh, creating problems for the students. Yeah. And and then is a is a the structure that is not adapting to enable uh, staff mobility yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Just that. Thanks, Melina. Actually, I would like to um, highlight five points in this discussion or comments. First of all, I think Melina made a very good uh, argument why students from Norway don't want to go to South simply because they are secured enough. I don't know if Sabina or Melina made this comment, but I, I completely agree with that because, you know, I coming also from poor country, from Egypt, and I have this motivation. I, okay, I have to look for project, for PhD, scholarship, for, for uh, going to somewhere else just to support myself and support my family. But if you are working here in Norway or living here in Norway, you very highly secured. Why you risk to go to... Uh, to go to another country. I am happy here. So I think this is a point that we found that students are uh, missing the, the motivation. Um, uh, I see that you have highlighted Erasmus Plus. Uh, I have good news for you. Uh, during uh, October months, uh, when I will start to launch this program, this uh, teaching uh, program with the students and for academic and non-academic, I found there is no motivation at all from our students for the same reason, of course. But I have discussed with the people at the administration and they promised us to have 12 Erasmus Plus scholarship for the staff. So actually you, uh, who will attend uh, this workshop and the PhD students who attended uh, this workshop or the other program, this student program, uh, anyone who are staff who has a contract with the university are allowed to uh, submit a sort of application for Erasmus Plus. Uh, and we will have sort of 12 scholarship. Two of them will be in waiting list because the deadline was in September for this year. So uh, there is two scholarship will put in the waiting list. Hopefully that there is uh, before uh, April next year that people will execute that they will not have their scholarship and then we will get this from them. And we will have five in 2020 and another five in 23. So this is a good thing. So actually this will be like sort of Two stage process. Uh, you, as people who, or as a staff who already uh, uh, enrolled in this workshop, you can uh, write the application. It's exactly the same application like the normal one, uh, but it will be uh, somehow, if you can just manage it in the text that you would like to make mobility in terms of a green shift, circular economy, big data. Uh, sustainability, something within the focus of the Cloud Earth I project. And then uh, we will approve, for example, four or uh, four of them, five of them. And then five of them will go to the higher level at the, uh, this uh, international mobility unit. And they will choose two of them to travel. So this is, this is something in addition to the certificate that you will get from this uh, project. Um, uh, regarding to uh, the point, I think um, uh, Milena as well highlighted that uh, here, uh, here at the university, we don't have this, fin this financial problem. You know, you said that if you are teaching a course here, multidisciplinary courses here at the philosophy department, all the credit will be will go to the uh, philosophy department and the other department will not get any money or any credit out of this course, even if they are already in this project. And actually, if you remember Shabby, we have discussed this just last Monday during we, in our internal group here, we start to discuss the strategy of the UIT. And we highlighted that UIT should remove the barrier between the institutes. Of course, we was discussing the barrier between the institute at the level of research, 
but why not? They should remove the barrier between the institute and the teaching, at the education. So uh, if there is two institutes, they are already share one course, like across disciplinary courses, why not give both of them equal amount of money? So something like this. So I think this is something because as you know, that there is a new strategy that is coming on. So may maybe you can highlight this in the new strategy. Uh, for the point that was highlighted by Christina about this uh, Tajikistan hub, you said that uh, there is a hub that was created some year ago in Tajikistan that okay. students can... One un no, not a hub. One university who, in their efforts, they created uh, instead of the equivalent of a job portal on their yep. website, their career center, but more one for students to upload their CVs and for the university to be able to certify their CVs. Yep. Actually, I would like to discuss here, or I would like to highlight here, this is part of the Cloud Earth I, this, this project. So in this Cloud Earth I project, I will present it tomorrow or uh, the next next day, uh, the second day of the workshop. Uh, and you will see that we run several programs, including even startup, supporting startup or putting money in a startup for students. But one of our objective as well is to uh, establish something called the Cloud Earth Hub. And in this Cloud Earth Hub, you as academic can upload your CV, can upload your uh, ideas, research idea. A business sector can upload job opportunities, can upload uh, problems. Students can upload their CV to this hub. And then the main idea is try to find match between them. So students can look for a job, uh, business can look for uh, students who are has high skill in order to help them to do some task, or we can connect business with academia in order to get money to do some research. So this is also part of this project. The point that I would like to discuss really with Christina, um, I don't know if Sabina was us still or not, about the microcredit. I I heard this point, this term microcredit. What is this microcredit? I, I haven't heard about it in Europe yet. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I heard about it was a couple of months ago in, uh, in a project with Malaysia. Okay. That, um, that they were starting to deliver um, micro credits for bits of courses. They were talking about like, cause in the project we were talking about developing a MOOC on sustainable campus. And, and they were saying that they, that for Malaysian students, what would be attractive would be if if the MOOC was like divided into modules and students could get micro credits for having completed certain modules or something. That was the first time I heard about it. Hmm. But because I, also I, I, heard... I still haven't heard it mentioned in the European context, but from what I understand it is just getting smaller bits of credits that make up part of a course. Yeah. Do, did, did you hear about this uh, Sabina before? This micro because Never, actually, no. no, because I was in just in a meeting in a month ago with uh, this student mobility unit and they just say that we are discussing something called microcredit. I don't know what's a microcredit. No. But <laughs> maybe this will be like a solution. Like, you know, if you have a short course between two countries, you can get just microcredit from it. And then uh, several of them can give you like five credit, 10 credit and so on. Yeah, I, but I mean, also cert uh, these certificates that we were discussing earlier, I, that could be also good, maybe good motivation for students, but at least, I mean, again, kind of talking from geology point of view, uh, then definitely we will need support from industry that they start to, to recognize certificates. You know, if you if you are interviewing three people for, for same job, and if two of them are coming with, with certificates from some university saying that they did something extra in addition to their diploma, I mean, for me, it would be natural to select them further because that means that they are really putting some effort to, to development. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe that's one way, even without kind of going around very uh, demanding mm -hmm. administration mm -hmm. at university. That requires another sitting down and discussing, uh, organizing a round table or discussion sessions with representatives of the industry. Exactly. So talking with them about what do you look at in the hiring process? Would you be, I'm, I'd be surprised if they wouldn't uh, because you, I mean, 
the uh, students, if they're hiring somebody who's recently graduated, um, the student's academic CV is just one part of it, their grades and everything. Um, because they, I mean, anybody who is in human resources and is good at their job should know that just uh, that you can't just go on a student's grades. Everybody knows that the, high, the students with the highest grades don't necessarily make the best workers. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because they, they're not necessarily the ones who can handle stress. You've got people who have a capacity of sitting down and sticking their head in a book and doing nothing but studying for four years and getting fabulous grades because they've got a great memory and they can't deal with a single challenge or something innovative or everything. They've only been in their books. They have no real world experience, no um, uh, things like that. So it, 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 if the, the, the people hiring you know, know what they're doing, they're already looking at other things. Yep. The, the issue tends to be more, I mean, at least here in Spain, the issue tends to be with the public sector. Mm. As in Spain, we have a case of titulitis. Um, <laughs> it, and <laughs> what they call it, you say, papelito habla, the paper speaks. If you don't have a certificate that proves you can do something, then you can't do it. I won't take uh, your word. Okay. And, yeah. and then the thing is, but the paper has to be by somebody. I recognize the credit. And the, it's, it's a big bullshit system in Spain in the public sector. <laughs> In the private sector, and it's terrible because it means you can't, how do you recognize if somebody is innovative or creative? You can't judge that on paper. <laughs> um, but the private sector, they, I mean, I think for a long time now, they, they, they're the ones who've been clamoring that students, grad, university graduates aren't well enough trained, that they're lacking certain soft skills and development, that it's not all about book learning. So, I mean, and this is a global issue. So the, I honestly don't think that they would care how official, whatever, if you have a way to say this student did this, they would take it into consideration. Yeah, in fact, we have started somehow discussion with industry. So a few weeks ago, we had EAT Raw Material University Days where we invited uh, people from industry, public sector and so on. And in fact, uh, it was also kind of panel discussion to discuss what kind of skills they expect from us to give, to build in students that they will hire. And I mean, we just started, but we really got some, we, we got some really good feedbacks. And now it's on us to kind of, to try to build that in our students. Mm -hmm. And also through this uh, Geo intern program that I mentioned during the interview, this is also a way how we are communicating with potential employers we are sending our students to, to, to industry. And, yeah. yeah, this is great. I think this is great discussion. I hope that you see as well, this is sort of some progress that we figure out the problem, the challenge, because you know, the course is cross disciplinary uh, courses, how to design it, challenge and opportunity. So we have a lot of challenge and also we have a lot of opportunities. So this is great. So I don't know if you have any comments. Um, I suggest maybe we can conclude the day here. Maybe just I would like to highlight two points if you don't have any comments more on other discussion. Um, uh, first of all, about our next session. So uh, our next session will be also a sort of um, two interviews, just short interviews. Uh, Actually, we will have one interview or one lecture from uh, USA. So like uh, get knowledge from uh, across the ocean and uh, another lecture from Austria. So just to see how other things and this is will be the Austrian one will be business oriented. The USA one is academic person who moved to the industry uh, sector. So he can reflect or he will reflect on his experience from this movement. Uh, and after that, we will give like um, 20 minute introduction about the Cloud Earth Eye and maybe another short introduction about how to build uh, a, a, broad, a, a course. This is a constructive alignment. And uh, we have a short discussion after that between us just in order to split us in small groups or small ideas. And um, from that day until the 10th of uh, uh, January, 
you are free to work together or to work with other, someone else in order to establish just uh, a short program. I hope that uh, this will be converted to a real course sometime next year or so. But at least if you just design a course and you say, yeah, this is a nice course, this is multidisciplinary course that collect, for example, IT with geology or philosophy with, uh, with IT, something like this, uh, this is enough. But of course, if you can bring it to a real life, just speak to the head of the institute, yeah, we would like to have this course and we have this plan, this would be great, of course. And um, the second- Her father, so it's- <laughs> <laughs> so dictatorship is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So I think I I would like to thank you very much for for the day today. I think it's I hope that you are see it like a conclusive day, something you get out of it. Um, tomorrow we'll start at ten o'clock uh, using the same uh, Zoom link. Mm -hmm. uh, I will send you uh, tonight uh, the link again because the people who didn't join us, they can get like a reminder. And then I assume tomorrow will be a bit shorter even than today. Like we will have two lecture and like 30 minutes just to present the cloud RSI and this uh, triangular, uh, this constructive alignment. And then we will follow with discussion just to find ideas of the project. And then you will be free for, for three, four weeks until after the Christmas to build this, this project. And um, I don't know if I can, uh, maybe tomorrow I can do that. I can send you the link for the uh, uh, first course, the first workshop of that was concluded last week, just to see the example of the presentation. The presentation to present the project, this will be in the 10th of, uh, the 10th of January, just 10, 20 minute presentation. This is very, very will be more than enough. Interesting. Yep, super. Good. So I would like to thank you all again and see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. All right. 10, 10 o'clock, I think all of us are in uh, Eastern Europe time, uh, Central, yes. Central. Okay, so 10 o'clock Central Europe time. I have, I have one question out of curiosity. Is Please. anybody here 100% from the university or from the country that you are currently working or living in? Or all of us in, already have an international background? So all of you are all, except for me, everyone's located in Norway, right? Yeah, and we're all so. foreigners. Are, are any of you Norwegians? No. So that are, also gives you an, an idea of the way you're talking about whether Norwegians interest or not. It's that we already have a group of people that, because um, my background's also a mix, uh, that you're already open to participate in new things and everything. And, and that also indicates a certain level of, of personality, um, you know, birds of a feather. So it's, it's more a way of how, how you can, I think if you want to change the things in Norway, you might actually have to go one-on-one -on -one discussing with colleagues and looking yeah. at that but maybe i can point to that i mean this is something that at home we are kind of discussing my husband and me uh, and maybe it's think also i mean i would not say that all croatians are so uh, you know willing to change things and move away so maybe just people they're moving away that they're differently coded from beginning so maybe this is a reason why we are in norway not sitting in croatia yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but well, yeah, it's called uh, selection bias in statistics. Okay, <laughs> selection bias statistics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, super. So thank right. you very much, and uh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.